Christopher VV here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, all of our over-the-air affiliates, podcast replay on Sirius XM, or maybe your video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. It is beautiful out today where I'm at. It's a perfect beach day. But I couldn't go to the beach because I have to be here with you. Because Brian Alvarez is not here. Filthy Tom Lawler is also not here. He's in Atlanta. He promises to be a colleague and not a colonizer. I'll get into what he is actually doing down in Atlanta a little bit later on in the show. But to begin... News on the WWE Network, which is in flux right now with its contract running out on Peacock. And where will it go and wherever it lands, what will the content be uh, uploaded? Because history fans like me are like cringing over the fact that everything that they've converted and posted, there's a really good shot that wherever the network ends up, that stuff won't be there. You know, and then they have so much in the vault that they haven't even touched yet that it just drives me nuts but wherever it goes it will not have germany's west side extreme wrestling on it anymore wxw is officially off the network as their deal with wwe ended yesterday it was the last indie on the wwe network early on in the network's history some of you may remember that wwe had plans to offer a tiered wwe network that would have different subscription levels that would have included independent wrestling and possibly live events from those groups but that plan ended up being scrapped and instead wxw evolve and progress all were added as and on-demand content so all of that is now over with and we'll see what happens with the network. A lot to get into today. We have AEW hopes for a TV deal with WBD. Got updates on that. Got a longtime talented creative from TNA being let go. Plus, all of the TV shows that are coming up this weekend. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper VV here with you. You know we do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want us 24-7... You can try to find us on Twitter slash X. I am at Semper Vivi. The website is at W-O-N-F-4-W. And the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley is at Jim Valley. He will be here with you live tomorrow, Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And then Andrew Zarian joins you on Sundays starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. I'd also love it if you made the wrestling news part of your day. Everything you need to know to get your day started or get you up to date every single day of the year. Find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts or head on over to WrestlingNews.com and at WrestlingNewsAV on X and Facebook. And while you're at it, if you really love pro wrestling, head on over to Patreon.com slash MidAtlanticPodcast. You, you won't be disappointed there. I was not disappointed, but really surprised by... Going to the front page of the website a little bit before the show and seeing this posted up by our own Joseph Courier. Following his release from WWE, Olympic gold medalist Gable Stevenson is pursuing a career in a new sport. And if you were to look at that headline, you would just probably naturally assume, okay, mixed martial arts. Where else is he going to go? How about the Buffalo Bills? At least that's what his agent told ESPN on Friday. The deal is a standard three-year rookie contract. Stevenson, who's got no prior football experience, will attempt to make it as a defensive tackle for the Bills. According to his agent, multiple NFL teams were interested in Stevenson. ESPN's Adam Schefter notes that due to his inexperience, Stevenson could be a candidate for the Bills practice squad this season. And they mean it when they say this guy's got no experience whatsoever. Uh, Schefter wrote, quote, the six foot one, 275 pound Stevenson is expected to play defensive line, something he hasn't done before in his athletic career. In fact, the first time Stevenson ever put on a pair of cleats was at a recent workout for the Bills, end quote. But Sean McDermott, the Bills head coach, who was a 
high school wrestling champion himself, uh, wanted Stevenson to play defensive line and believes he's got the potential it takes to make an impact. Football guys tend to love wrestling guys because of the footwork, because of the intensity, because of the toughness, because they don't have a problem bumping heads and going head up with somebody. So there are a lot of very translatable skills for a football player moving over to wrestling. But in most cases, before a guy got to college, they actually had played football before. This is going to be a a huge... I mean, Brock Lesnar played football because that's who he's going to be compared to the most is going to be Brock because they both went to the University of Minnesota. They both had time in WWE before they wanted to get into football. And... You know, Brock made it up until one of the very last cuts on that team, but they just, Minnesota Vikings, in 2004, I believe it was, just couldn't have, the, they didn't have the time to develop him. They thought it probably was too late for that, but he put on a hell of an effort, but Brock had played before. Carlton Hasselrig is going to be a name that you'll probably hear brought up when it comes to this as well, too, because he's the only guy ever in the history of college to win three division two and three division one wrestling titles. It was before in 1990, they changed the rules, but in 87, 88 and 89, he actually won D two at the university of Pittsburgh, Johnstown moved on. And a lot of people in wrestling wanted him too, but it was just one of those things where he had a line to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And that is exactly what he did after winning all of those titles but again, he had played football in high school before, and he ended up being a huge success for Pittsburgh. He actually made the Pro Bowl in 1992. He played up until 1995. After that, he ended up dabbling in MMA for a little while in Elite XC. I know he was there for a little bit. Unfortunately, died of liver disease in 2020 and ended up after he passed away. They, they diagnosed him with CTE afterwards. But, you know, Lesnar and Hasselrig, and there have been a couple of others as well, too, who have tried to make that jump, but never with that amount of inexperience. So that is what, you know, if you were hoping he would go into MMA, there's still a shot for it. But we're also in an age with the NFL, with these practice squads, with the ability to, to hold talent for a year and be able to pay them and all that he could end up staying there for a couple of years and, and actually literally developing on a taxi squad as if it was the early 70s again. TNA wrestling is a hell of a transition. TNA wrestling, where Gable Stevenson probably could have been, except they probably can't afford him. And apparently they got a lot of changes going on in creative and when it comes to live events as uh, one resignation and uh, a couple of layoffs of some others have uh, affected the company. This was posted up to the front page earlier on today by Josh Nason. Dave Meltzer first reported in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter that Robert R.D. Evans had resigned this week with PW Insider later reporting that the relationship between the de facto head of creative and TNA had, quote, grown strained in recent weeks, end quote, which had left Evans frustrated. I'll just jump in here to say uh, from the report that, as you recall, Scott Demore, uh, towards the end of last year, I believe it was, maybe it was early this year, he ended up leaving the company, reportedly tried to buy the company from Anthem, and they turned him down, and uh, apparently they, they held a meeting with Leonard Asper and uh, with some other management people who were there. I guess there was an airing of the grievances on both sides. Didn't, it's not like anybody, you know, uh, bolted, you know, because of Scott Demore leaving. But we have seen some people after their contracts have run out, like the Motor City Machine Guns and some others who have departed TNA. Another hit for them, at least when it goes on reputation, is PW Insider noting that Dave Sahadi is gone after being laid off. Sahadi was the company's creative director starting in 2019 and also worked for prior TNA ownership for 18 years as a director of their broadcast. Sahadi also worked as a creative director for WWE in his past, 
Brian has talked about it on the show. Dave has talked about it on Wrestling Observer Radios. And in fact, you will probably hear anybody that had anything to do with Dave Sahadi tell you how great of a video producer that he was. One of, Sometimes you would watch a TNA broadcast from a couple years ago, a couple more years ago than that. And the video package to introduce the pay-per-view was awesome the deep voice voiceover for it. And it was a really cool thing. Well, that's what Sahadi had brought to the table. And apparently he was well liked and uh, for years, and I've never heard anybody say anything terrible about his work or anything like that. But unfortunately for him, he's being laid off. Who's taking over as the lead of creative and how are the other spots going to be filled is all up in the air right now. PW Insider also reported that the other layoffs in the live events group are part of restructuring efforts, but no specific names were attached, nor a succession plan, and they got to figure out something. TNA's got a bunch of shows coming up. They got a busy schedule through the first weekend of August with several TV tapings, the, uh, the Against All Odds streaming special, and July Slammiversary pay-per-view. Their next show is two weeks away in Chicago, so... We'll see what happens there. We'll see how much impact that NXT has with uh, with TNA coming soon. Uh, according to Shawn Michaels, there are some very exciting announcements on the way. He was interviewed by KTNV Channel 13 in Las Vegas today, doing some PR leading into the uh, show coming up at the uh, Apex uh, in a couple of weeks. But... He was asked, should we expect to see more cross-promotion involving NXT and non-WWE promotions in the future? And he said, of course, while it's above him, he's sure that some very exciting announcements are coming soon. Not as fast as these commercials, though. So I'll say, we'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Back to the show, Mike Semper BB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Of course, the big boss man, Brian Alvarez, because it is Friday. He is out doing things with his family and good for him it's almost summer though what's his excuse going to be then well i guess he'll still be doing stuff with his family i guess not making paper mache heads at school but uh if you want more brian you know how to do it you become a member of f4wonline.com only 12.99 a month 119.99 a year and uh credit card paypal bitcoin if that's your thing you just go to f4wonline.com slash sign up get all the news from the wrestling observer newsletter you get to read it yourself as opposed to having people aggregated get a bunch of stuff wrong no see things wrong in their original way they're supposed to be which is some misspellings from dave and maybe some run-on sentences i kid i kid wrestling observer.com uh, f4wonline.com you know what to do wwe smackdown is tonight on fox from inside the MVP Arena in Albany, New York. I wish MVP was back in some form doing something. I'm always greatly entertained by MVP. I wish he was back. I'm happy everybody made it back from Saudi Arabia in one piece. Literally. But, um, you know, no no issues on the tarmac. No, uh, no, no crazy things happening. No, no. There's Nia Jax coming back as the winner of the Queen of the Ring. And... I haven't seen anything uh, updated here before the show. Maybe they've announced some new matches on social media or something like that, but there was not anything really announced match-wise uh, before the show. We got Nia Jax's coronation ceremony. We got WWE Women's Champion Bailey and Piper Niven are probably going to be doing something with each other considering Niven attacked Bailey after... Uh, Bailey defeated Chelsea Green in Saudi Arabia last Saturday, so it only makes sense that, you know, Niven and Bailey get into it because you don't have that much time. You only got a couple of weeks before Clash at the Castle, and it only makes sense, too, that Piper Niven is getting the shot at Bailey in Scotland and it makes 100% sense to me. It's like Drew McIntyre getting the shot at Clash at the Castle. Only makes sense. And then. Undisputed Universal Champion Cody Rhodes will also be making an appearance. Hopefully, we know what is going to be going on with him and his next title feud. WWE is on the road this weekend as well, if you happen to be in and around the New York State area. On Saturday, they're going to be at the Westchester County Arena in White Plains, New York. And on Sunday, they'll be at the Visions Veterans Memorial Arena in Binghamton, New York. 
ratings news for all of you who like to throw things around. And boy, if you like to uh, to throw things back and forth at each other over ratings and over TV things, this is the show for you. Dave has given you a whole lot of ammunition to beat on each other with. I'll get to the ratings first, and I know we mentioned this yesterday. Get into it with a little bit more detail. NXT drew a total audience of 703,000 viewers to USA on Tuesday. That was a 7% increase from their audience the week before of 654,000. I don't know if you can... Put it all on Sexy Red. I mean, that was the only thing that they had really advertised for the show that was out of the ordinary and anything special. Probably drove up the 18 to 49-year-old demographic. That was up 41%. Uh, went to a 024 this week. So that along with TNA Knockouts champion Jordan Grace appearing to challenge Roxanne Perez and all-ego Ethan Page who looks like he's going to get the next shot at Trick Williams in the NXT title. So, uh, good good showing for NXT there. Let's see if they can hold up the, uh, the, the next week. Wednesday's AEW Dynamite, 787,000 viewers to TBS. So, that's up more than 10% from the week prior, which did 713,000. The 18 to 49 year old demographic was a .25, up slightly from last week's .24 demo rating, but... It's the overall number there that matters as they creep closer to 800,000 again. They, it was a mix of obviously the NBA and the NHL playoffs. Yes, that has a lot to do with it. But what also had a lot to do with it is you didn't give, in my opinion, people a whole lot of reason to tune in sometimes and or stick with the show throughout. But you have the pay-per-view. You get a fresh start right now. You don't have the NBA playoffs in your way. This is a good time to get your stuff together and try to move forward, move into Forbidden Door, and then move on for the rest of summer, obviously building up into All In and All Out at the end of August and at the beginning of September. There's, there's always a silver lining there. There's always going to be a tomorrow. And with AEW... <laughs> You know, for some, you know, there is no tomorrow, but there is always a tomorrow. And hopefully they can kind of get some of their stuff straight. Um, you can't blame the NBA anymore. And that's if you're AEW or WWE, because the NBA Finals schedule has been announced now that Dallas has eliminated Minnesota. And Dallas and the uh, Mavericks and the Boston Celtics are now going to play best of seven series this is when the shows, when the shows, when the games have been announced. Thursday, June 6th, Sunday, June 9th, Wednesday, June 12th. So there's one against AEW and Friday, June 14th. It's Rampage, who cares? If it goes longer than that, which it invariably will, it's hard for me to believe that Boston is going to sweep Dallas or vice versa. But Monday, June 17th. That's going to be a pivotal game. Game five, you know, if the series happens to be 3-1, it's going to be a heavily watched game. So that is probably going to smack Raw. But then after that, Thursday, June 20th, and then Sunday, June 23rd. So the NBA has left a clear path here where you cannot complain. And I'm sorry, hockey does not do that well where you can complain about it if you're a wrestling fan. It, it, just, it doesn't work. It wouldn't work if you were WWE. It doesn't work if you're AEW. Nothing to complain about now. Now, moving to some more things that people can argue about. In this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave Meltzer provided some further insight into the financial terms being discussed in the current AEW and WBD TV rights renewal negotiations, ones that Meltzer reports will make the company profitable if they can get them. Meltzer wrote that the per-year figures are being discussed. Excuse me. Meltzer wrote that the per year figures being discussed, quote, are said to be considerably more than the estimated one hundred and ten million dollars per year or slightly more that would in theory take the company into profitable range. There is talk of figures being between 50 percent above and as much as nearly double the current number number already said to be on the table. The latter figure in particular would open up the potential tens of millions more annually for talent acquisitions and other expansions in the budget. End quote. 
Both sides are still negotiating as of now. In January of 2020, AEW's existing deal with WBD was extended for four years at $175 million total, which included the addition of Rampage. That's why Tony Khan, whenever he says, am I open to doing more shows? Am I open to doing more hours a week? Yeah, if you're paying me to do them. There's a law of diminishing returns. I think we've seen that when it comes to Rampage already. WBD later picked up a one-year extension that will take the relationship through the end of this year. It is assumed that AEW got more money with the addition of Collision last June. Let's hope so. Actually, it doesn't, who cares about who hopes so? As long as Tony Khan is happy with the money that he got or whatever they gave him, maybe it was some magic beans or something like that, I would have held out for cash for another two-hour show. But it's unknown how much they got if they did get any money. The new TV rights negotiations include streaming rights, as Brian talked about earlier on this week, which are currently not available domestically. However, Meltzer stated that the talks are not serious when it comes to an outright purchase of pay-per-view distribution rights like WWE and Peacock with their PLEs or that UFC has with ESPN. If I was AEW, I think I'd be a little leery of that anyway. I mean, and we're going to get to some pay-per-view numbers in a moment, but you're making $50 a pop. And if WBD already has ownership, which they are reported, rumored to have in AEW, but whether they do or not, you're already getting money from them. To me, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. If they're not going to push that issue, I would be glad I would be glad to have my pay-per-views to be able to distribute and take in 100% of that money. Now, once those shows happen, I do want a carriage deal with WBD that maybe, you know, gets the back catalog of everything up on Max. I think that would be great. But when it comes to the pay-per-views themselves, eh, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of being able to take all of that money. Earlier on this week, Puck's... Matt Belloni, or Bello, okay, I'm not sure how to say his name. I'm going to turn into Brian from earlier on this week. But uh, the Puck Newsletter reported that AEW head Tony Khan was disappointed with WBD's initial offer, a statement that AEW denied on the same day. Now, those pay-per-view numbers I was talking about from last Sunday's AEW Double or Nothing, we have some preliminary numbers in, according to Dave Meltzer, who reports that the total estimated buys are in the 133,000 range. I don't care how bad the TV is for AEW. You can set your watch to it. They're going to do between 120 and like 150,000 every single month. And some of that may atrophy a little bit as they continue to put shows on. But I don't know how much. It's not going to be enough where they probably should run shows 12 a year at the very least. Sorry about your wallets, kids. But we'll get in more of this and some other stuff when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Observer Live. Big Boss Man Brian Alvarez will be back with me on Monday. Jim Valley will be here with you tomorrow, Saturdays. 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Andrew Zarian. Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. I was saying before the break, Dave Meltzer reported in the uh, newest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, 133,000. That's what they're looking at about right now. He notes the reporting on numbers is a little slow due to Memorial Day weekend. He stated that as of now, TV buys were up 9.5% from April's Dynasty pay-per-view with the streaming numbers in the U.S. way up and about the same internationally, uh, adding that the TV numbers are way down. So the people ordering through traditional means just falls even further, but they are making that up when it comes to internet buys and uh, other ways to get the show this this time around you could get it through youtube you could get it through youtube tv i believe you, you could order it directly through there you could order it uh just a multitude of ways so a lot of people did not take the traditional option this time around if the and you know and that a lot of that may also have to do with the fact that some of us were ordering through traditional tv means because the br app just sucks so bad that that was the really the entire reason why i would actually go through and order it through traditional means but 
If the show ends in that range, Dave notes, it will be down from last year, which did about 140000 or so. Last year's show did not have Dynasty the month prior, though. So as I mentioned before the break, we're going to continue to see AEW ad pay-per-views. And until otherwise stated, noted, shown, they're going to do well. Regardless of what the build is, regardless of what you think, individually, personally, subjectively about anything that AEW does when it comes to the pay-per-views, which usually artistically deliver, again, subjective, but there is usually enough on a five-hour show to wet enough people's tastes and satisfy them where it is worth your money, whether you like everything or not. Also noted uh, by Dave in the newsletter that the gate at the MGM Grand Garden Arena was just under 800000 on 7500 paid, 9000 total. That is down from last year's show at the T-Mobile Arena in the same city, which had a gate nearing 900000 based on 9000 paid, 10500 total. As far as what takes place in the ring for AEW, everything is on the magic of videotape. AEW Rampage is tonight on TNT with matches taped on Wednesday at the Kia Forum in Inglewood, California. No spoilers. You can try to figure these out for yourself. The TNT Title Eliminator series of matches will begin with Konosuke Takeshita taking on Penta El Zero Miedo. Hmm. Now that would be one that I would say, and I did not look at the spoilers for this. I was just told what the matches were going to be for the show. On paper, it better be Konosuke Takeshita. You had a match on that pay-per-view for absolutely no reason whatsoever. There was no reason to add John Moxley against Konosuke Takeshita. Why? To give Moxley a win? To give him a win over Takeshita? I mean, Takeshita, of those two guys, probably could have used a, like, a flossy win. So, like, if you wanted to put on a banger, you put should have put on Takeshita beating somebody. But that's just me. Anyway, it's Takeshita against Penta. You can decide on who you think is going to win. Ray Phoenix also wrestles on the show against Isaiah Cassidy. Talked about, like, who the designated guy, but is it Commander, is it Rocky Romero right now? Like, the guy who just appears on every show and puts on a good performance and then takes a big old fat L? Isaiah Cassidy. Always entertaining, takes one hell of an ass whipping, but that's what he does is takes an ass whipping. Satnam Singh is going to face Peter Avalon. Kyle O'Reilly against Jordan Cruz. And an AEW World Women's Title Eliminator match between Tony Storm and Viva Van. Then, AEW Collision on Saturday was taped on Thursday night at the Acrisure Arena in Palm Springs, California. Will Ospreay will make the first defense of the international title that he won last Sunday against Kyle O'Reilly. That is a match that I know I saw as soon as it was put up on the screen on Wednesday that a lot of people were popping for. I mean, it's just, it is one of those matches that I don't think we've ever seen before. I don't think they had crossed paths. I'd have to go deep back looking in the cage match to see if they had crossed paths in New Japan before, or possibly in Ring of Honor. I don't, I don't believe that they have, certainly not one-on-one. -on -one, so seems to be a lot of people looking forward to that match. Johnny TV takes on Claudio Cassignoli. That sounds like it'll be entertaining. Katsuyori Shibata and Daniel Garcia against the Work Horsemen. Roderick Strong against Leo Rush. How happy I was to see Leo Rush back in the mix. And I know Roderick Strong's probably going to win this match. But damn, I like Leo Rush being back in any mix. And in fact, I hope he doesn't even sign with AEW. I just like him popping up on shows, whether it be gcw or tna or i don't care where it is in fact i kind of hope it's in tna so he shows up in nxt and we get a match between him and javon evans so if Shawn michaels wants to do something nice for everybody put that one together for me that's going to be my request leo rush against javon evans thunder rosa will face triple a's reina dorada and shane taylor and lee moriarty will take on jarell nelson and royce isaacs the brutuses the 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 evil combination that turned on filthy Tom Lawler broke up Team Filthy. 
these bastards. The West Coast Wrecking Crew, they're going to get their shine against Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty. And I would say in the easiest match to predict of the night, the Gabe Agony and Brian Cage in a six-man against KM, Danny G, and Danny Rose. Good luck, KM, Danny G, and Danny Rose. FTR is apparently also going to cut a promo alongside Tony Schiavone where uh, they they talk about still going after the Elite and still going after the Young Bucks for the AEW World Tag Team title. So I don't, again, I don't know the specifics of things there, but it looks like FTW or FTR is still going after the Young Bucks. So New Japan Pro Wrestling, their Dominion show at Osaka Joe Hall. Next Sunday is coming together, IWGP. World Champion John Moxley is going to be defending against Evil in a match that I'm absolutely not looking forward to. And now that they've added a stipulation, I'm looking forward to it even less. This is a quote from Evil to New Japan's website. Quote, since this low-life mud show wrestler... Mud show? Low-life mud show wrestler John Moxley? That's what Evil... Anyway, what is he listening to over there? Anyway, since this low-life mud show wrestler wants to run away from any kind of a fair fight under IWGP rules, and I have something for him, June 9th in Osaka Joe Hall, a lumberjack match for the title. That way he has no escape. He can talk about gang warfare all he wants, but in all he has in his gang of reprobates is that waste of space umino, right? I'm not going to go on. This is just a way where we can have a whole lot of House of Torture nonsense in a John Moxley match, I guess, if we get some surprise appearance. I don't know who we're going to get, though. I'm just assuming. It's not like I think Claudio and Brian Danielson are going over or something like that. You know, that would be nice, I guess. But I, I would assume it's going to be Shooter and Yuya Uramura and everybody else that, that's on the roster. I, again... This is not a match I'm looking forward to. I'm looking past this to whatever uh, Moxley's going to have coming up. The best of the Super Juniors 31 finals will take place on that show as well. And Taiji Ishimori defeated Hiromu Takahashi in the main event of tonight's show, or today's show, to finish block play with 14 points. That means the semifinals are set for Monday at Corican Hall. A block first place El Desperado faces B block second place Doki. And B block first place Taiji Ishimori will face B block second place uh, TJP. Uh, or A-Block, second place, TJP. The finals are going to take place on June 9th at Dominion. Also on that show, the Never Openweight title will be on the line, Shingo Takagi against Hinare. On paper, I, know, I love Shingo Takagi. <coughs> Pardon me. And I, either way, I'm fine. I like Hinare as a character. He's one of the newer, fresher guys that they have. They gave him, they've given him a new coat of paint. They put the, you know, the, the war paint on him and, and all that sort of stuff, made him more savage and all that. Like, he's one of those guys, like a Gabe kid right now, like several others, where, let's go. This would probably be a good thing if he wins this title. What does Shingo need with the never open weight title anyway? Give Hanari that belt and let's see what he can do with it. If he fumbles and fails miserably, you run a million shows all over the place. You run a million shows in conjunction with Rev Pro. You're coming over to the States multiple times this year. You can get that belt off of him. Go ahead, give it to him, and see what he can do with it. New Japan World Television title match. Jeff Cobb defends against Tomohiro Ishii. Jeff Cobb needs a big win with that belt. Big Jeff Cobb fan. Give him the win over Ishii. That would make me happy. And the provisional King of Pro Wrestling 2024 championship, Yuya Uemura defends against the Great Okan. There are no winners here. There are, there are none. There's also going to be a four-way uh, to determine the next contender to the IWGP Tag Team and NJPW Strong Tag Team title with Kenta Chase Owens, Kenta and Chase Owens, El Fantasmo and Hikaleo, Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi, and Mikey Nichols and Shane Haste the same four teams that they have all of the time. I mentioned earlier on that our own filthy Tom Lawler is in Atlanta to get a check balance. If I'm filthy Tom Lawler, be wary of two chains. I heard that he lies. But he's there for Battle Riot 6, MLW 
Sunday from a sold-out center stage in Atlanta. He is going to be facing off with MLW World Heavyweight Champion Satoshi Kojima. I'm looking forward to that match. I know Filthy is looking forward to that match. I don't know if Kojima is or not. He's just looking forward to the... Uh, the bountiful uh, display of bread that Court Bauer gives him so he can celebrate with muffins and rolls. And as king of bread, he needs these things to function. And we'll see what happens when he faces off against filthy Tom Lawler. Also on that show, MLW World Women's Featherweight Champion Janai Kai will face off against Delmi Exo. A ritual combat match, Alex Kane with Mr. Thomas in his corner against the former top dollar, AJ Francis. And then a 40-man battle riot match. There are 12 unannounced participants, I believe, as of now. I'm not going through all of these names, but some of these names. Jimmy Yang. Ernest the Cat Miller. Davy Boy Smith Jr. Bobby Fish. Mystico. Violent J. Ricky Shane Page. Matthew Justice. Bad Dude Tito, Manders, Akira, Rigido, and of course, Paul Walter Hauser. A lot of you guys love that dude. I, I The only thing I've seen him in was the Tanya Harding story, as uh, and he was very good in that. I, I know nothing else that he's ever been in. I've never seen anything that he's been in, but he's apparently the biggest wrestling fan in all of Hollywood right now. He is, he has replaced uh, David Arquette. And when you're in a match like that and you're around people like Ricky Shane page and Matthew justice and Manders and all that, watch for the light tubes. I don't know if they'll be in the, in the battle riot show, but just in general, Paul, Watch for the light tubes. While was on IG, I was Go in the be back to put a bow on this thing in a little bit. Wrestling Observer Live. The show, Mike Semper TV here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. You can only hear what myself and producer Dom, and not producer Dom, I knew I was going to do that. Producer Daniel talk about during the breaks. How dare I slander Daniel's name by comparing him to Dom, who is a reprobate and a terrible human being because he usually sides with Brian Alvarez, who's not here with you. He's not here with you. I'm here with you. I'm always here with you, folks. Like CMLL's weekly Friday night shows, you can count on me. Their Copa Junior VIP 2024 final takes place tonight between Star Junior and Angel de Oro. Satoshi Kojima will be making an appearance on that show as well, teaming up with Okamura to defend the MLW World Tag Team titles against Magia Blanca and Rugido. And if you like the little guys, there is a micro title match with micro gemello one if i'm saying that correctly against shemwell shemwell against micro gemello one for the uh former midgets title now the world micro title game changer wrestling also this weekend with two shows from their home base at the showboat in atlantic city and i wish i was there it's going to be streamed on triller tv tournament of uh, survival nine is on saturday jcw jersey championship wrestling after hours four will be late night saturday that's free on youtube and then cage of survival three on sunday there's going to be a gauntlet match to determine a new gcw world heavyweight champion as blake christian has been stripped of that title by acting general manager matt cardona because he is just dropping too many falls in ring of honor apparently and he went to go work the new japan best of the super juniors so that title's off of him. I don't know if they got everything they wanted out of that deal, but uh, that's how it goes. A lot of people thought Matt Cardona was going to win the title, but uh, didn't end up being the case. Biggest match on the show, though, to me, Effie against Mance Warner in the cage of survival. I don't want to thank producer Dom. I do want to thank producer Daniel. And I do want to thank video engineer John who is also here with you every Friday. We're the Trees and Trio here with you on Fridays when all these other schmucks are taken off and bandying about and matriculating at their kids' school. We are here with you. And Jim Valley's going to be here with you tomorrow. Andrew Zarian on Sunday. As always, everybody, be good. And we shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>